We're on, on the subject of the kiss, and it sounds like a strange theme to be talking about in the church, but there are so many different kisses that we read about in the Scripture. We started off by, by drawing this picture for you, and uh, we spoke about, last time we spoke about the kiss of life there in the garden, how God breathed life into man, how man died, God breathed life again into him, life, abundant life, and then eternal life. Well, today we're on this one here. And we call this one the kiss of reconciliation. Reconciliation. Now, I guess I could happily say this today, that in the context of a robust world in which we live, in the context of families with different opinions, different ethics, different morals, different standards, there is so much conflict out there that we tend to sometimes think, well, that's the way life is, and that's the way it's going to be, que sera, sera. Well, I want to suggest to you that there's an answer to our diversity of opinion, of color, of culture, and it's found in, in a beautiful verse, and it comes in Psalm 85, verse 10. And this is the basis for what I want to talk about today. It is such a, a short, it's more of a statement that comes out of the verse. It says this, righteousness and peace have kissed. That's what the psalmist says. Now, righteousness, we all know that we have no righteousness of our own to speak of. We have right behavior we'd like to find. But righteousness comes from God. And God is the one who gives us and is totally righteous. Therefore, He can give it to us. So he's talking about righteousness. He's not talking about us. He's talking about God's righteousness. That God's righteousness, on the one hand, when it meets with the needs of mankind, leads to peace. And when God's righteousness kisses the needs and the challenges of humanity and just being a human being, then peace is the end result. So this is our starting point today. You know, if we look at the issue of reconciliation, sometimes I think about it in the terms of, of an accounting term where we have to reconcile our accounts and we have to make sure that everything balances and that all the, all the details have been done and we find out where this went and where that went and, and we reconcile our accounts. And that might be fine in an accounting world because an accounting world deals with facts and figures. In the real world in which we live, we're not dealing with facts and figures. We're dealing with a broken humanity. We're dealing with a broken humanity that is different values for different things at different times. And reconciliation, this peace with God coming as a result of the righteousness of God kissing the need of mankind, is where it all begins. Now, I have another passage that I want to read to you, and it comes from 2 Corinthians 5, and it's all about re reconciliation. And it goes like this, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. It's one of my favorite verses. When you're in Christ, you become a new creation. He is a new creation. All that is old has gone, and the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Not counting man's sin. God's not an accountant. This is not an accounting term. He's not counting our sins and saying, oh, you've passed the threshold now. You've had, your, you've had your full allocation of sin allowance. God is not counting any sin of man against them. He has committed to us in the message of reconciliation. That's a great message the world needs to hear. God wants to be reconciled to you. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now, um, we were just chatting in the room just now with the worship team about um, what reconciliation looks like. Remember in the 90s, from about 95 onwards, there was what we had in our country, a truth and Reconciliation Committee that ran for a number of years seeking to reconcile a broken nation. 
a nation that had hurt one another over the course of many years. And there was blame that was thrown both ways, and there was so much pain, and there was so much suffering. And so they saw a need for a reconciliation, a national reconciliation to take place. They saw the need for this. They realized that something needed to be done. And so this Reconciliation Commission was called upon, and so many incredible stories were shared. Over the course of years, we listened to these stories, these heartbreaking stories of people hurting people, and you all know that hurt people hurt people. And as we went from one degree of hurt to another degree of hurt, and as people came out and shared the truth, that's why they called it the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, because there can be no reconciliation, they realized, without it being founded upon the basis of, of truth. And so people were encouraged to come and tell their stories with no, with no recourse, with no punishment. Come and tell your stories and forgiveness and reconciliation will come out of that. Now, that was an incredibly good thing to do. And I was fascinated in those days and listening to the stories that were being told, so many incredible, incredible stories. But this thing about truth is important. You all know the verse in John 8 where it says that the truth will what? Will set, you, will set you free. But that's not the only thing that the truth does. The truth can make you mad. The truth can make you incredibly sad. The truth can make you incredibly glad if you follow it through to the end. And reconciliation is the ultimate outcome. And so truth doesn't just set you free. It also makes you mad and sad over the hurts. It makes you mad at the things that have been done, but really glad at the end of it that you did the truth and reconciliation thing. And so I'm hoping today, in the context of just this group of people here today, and the needs and the brokenness that maybe you're living in, whether it be in family, whether it be business, whether it be in national, whether it be in friendships, whether it be in the church. You know, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. But I, you know where this sermon is going to apply today. So I just pray, I implore you to make it apply. Now, as I was studying this yesterday, I began to notice that in every one of the points that uh, when you prepare a sermon, you, you just let your mind go crazy, and you just write down everything that comes into your mind, boom, 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 and then you take out what you think is relevant, and you put it out there, and I began to put, it, put together these thoughts, and, and I began to notice that each of the, the points that I have, or many of them that I had, all began with an R. Because if you prepare a sermon, you're looking for key words, key themes, key concepts. And I was looking for key words as it related to reconciliation. And the strange thing was, most of them began with an R. And so what I want to do is take you through my journey of R's that I came up with the other day. Uh, yesterday as I was contemplating this. We took talking about the kiss of reconciliation and uh, if you want to write these down, take them home, ponder them, chew on them, that's great. Or you can go back and watch the service again on YouTube or whatever it is. But reconciliation begins, first of all, with a resolve. There's got to be a resolve for something better. There's got to be something inside of you that cries, this is just not good. There's got to be something inside of you that says, I need the courage, because it's a courage issue, to stand against the things that are hurtful and to make a decent re reaction to what is facing me. Many of us don't understand this because we're not courageous enough to address the issues that are staring us in the face. We're not brave enough to realize that there's an elephant in the room when we meet people, and we need to take that elephant down. So the first thing that we need to have is a resolve. Then we need to realize, first of all, that there is a need to be able to do this. We look at the repercussions of not doing this, and we realize, man, this has got to be done. I've got to realize that I have to do something, be courageous, and make this thing happen. And then we need, in the process that we can apply this to the, the context of the truth and reconciliation, we have to remember, remember the stuff. That's painful, man. I thought I could just squash the stuff. 
and put it under the table and pretend that it's not there. Or put a carpet over it and just sweep it under the carpet and hope that one day it will just go away. But you all know that the carpet eventually gets so big and a volcano erupts if you keep hiding it for that long. So we need to do like the, the Spirit of God said to the church in Ephesus. Revelation chapter 2, there's this church. And God is talking to this church. And He's saying to them, you may look good. On the outside, you do all the religious things really well, but you have lost your first love. And he says this to them. He says, now you need to remember the height from which you have fallen. Just remember. You remember the days when worship was so authentic in the, in the temple, when worship was so personal and you could understand it and you felt it. And you'd, just remember those days. Remember those days when I was close to you and we won victories and I answered prayer and I met with you personally. Remember those days. But while you're remembering those days, remember the good, the bad, and the ugly that has happened as well is what the truth and reconciliation was all about. We need to remember, not because we're gloating on it, not because we want to make it bigger than it should have been, but it begins by remembering the height from which we've fallen with a sense of hope that we can get back there again. The temptation over here is to reject the truth and just say, ah, no, truth is a relative thing. It's just that my truth versus your truth. We don't need to talk about what's true, and we reject the truth. Maybe we refuse to accept the truth as it applies to us. And we say, well, you know, I, I've got an image to uphold. I don't want to acknowledge that I could have been a part of this thing that has led to this dis dysfunctional relationship. And we refuse and we, and we reject the truth. Or sometimes even worse, and probably the worst of all, is we repress the truth. We hold it down. We hold it down. And every time the truth comes up, we push it down and we tell another lie. And then that comes up again and we create another lie. And eventually a lie leads to a lie leads to a lie leads to exposure of all the lies that you have told in order to repress the, the truth. And so the kiss of, re of reconciliation begins with a resolve. We need to realize the need for it. We need to remember the heart from which we've fallen. Don't fall into the temptation of rejecting truth, of refusing the truth, and repressing the truth. Have you got it so far? Now, this is a very reckless sermon. These are R for you. This is reckless thinking. In a day in which we live... <sighs> Where life is about me, we're all about convenience, we're all about how I feel, and we're all about the way that we want to do things. Anything that doesn't appeal to your own human nature is reckless thinking. And with reckless comes another R word called risky. You say, isn't it a bit risky if I get vulnerable on the issues of pain and suffering and hurt that I have caused to others or have received from others? Isn't that a bit risky? Absolutely it is. That's what makes it worth doing. That's why we don't do it. Because it's risky that your vulnerability is going to be seen. We don't want to be seen to be vulnerable. We don't want to be seen to be weak or in need. We don't want to see that. If you want to join a really great group, you know, that is dealing with the issues of addiction right now, any form of addiction, not just substance addiction, but addiction to any bad habits we may have. On Monday nights, there is a group that meets here at the church called Project Exodus. And it's an incredible meeting where people sit down and they tell the truth. Can you believe that? People sit together and they tell the truth. And I hear the stories coming out of this group of people as they make, come to terms with the truth, as they love one another, even in the midst of the truth, as they encourage one another, they cheer one another on, they support one another. They're not taking the responsibility away from the person, but that person is speaking into a context of other messed up people, of which, by the way, we all are pretty messed up. And so in the beauty of this environment of truth and love, truth and God's uh, righteousness, the beauty of wholeness comes out. So it is, it can be somewhat risky business. Now, there can be no reconciliation without a few things. First thing I want to suggest, and this is what we hate the most, 
is there can be no reconciliation without repentance. That's a genuine acknowledgement of the role that I have played in the situation. And you will say, well, it's my truth versus your truth. No, 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 no. You put your truth down and you live out the other person's truth. And when you suddenly see the hurt that you may have caused and you begin to repent of that, that's the beginning of the foundation of moving this forward. But there is a poor cousin of repentance. We call it remorse. And this is crocodile tears. This is one where we say, oh, oh, I'm just not sorry that I've hurt you. I'm just sorry that I've been found out. I mean, sorry that, I, that you've caught me in my situation. And therefore, I will cry as if I'm repenting, but I'm not really. With the one hand, I've got my fingers crossed, and I'm remorsing over the things that I have done. And then in all of this thing, as we, as we work out the difference between repentance and remorse, I need to give you an example of this. Have a look at two Old Testament characters who lived at the same time. David on the one hand, and Saul on the other hand. David, when caught at the primary time of his life when he messed up so badly with Bathsheba, and the prophet Nathan came in and told him the truth, David's immediate, it was an immediate response to say, oh my word, I did think that I'd got away with it, but now I haven't. And it's almost a picture in your mind where Nathan tells him, you are the man, you know, and David falls off his throne, and it says he repented before God. It was an instantaneous response to the revelation of the truth. And then comes King Saul. King Saul had so much potential. He could have been a great king, but he had an ego, man, and his ego was important to him. And when he saw young King David coming up through the ranks, he rebelled. There's another R. He rebelled, and he said, I don't want this young whippersnapper coming up through the ranks. And so he lied, and he manipulated, and he did everything that could possibly be wrong. And then when he was found out, he got into a thing called remorse. And he held Samuel, the prophet, down. He said, Samuel, I have done wrong. But Samuel, I want to continue doing wrong, but I want you to forgive me. And Samuel says, I can't do that. Genuine repentance. And then the big R over here is that everybody needs to take responsibility. You're saying to yourself, well, I'll forgive when the ability, well, you're, I'll forgive. I'll forgive when the other person apologizes to me. Chances are he's never or she's never going to apologize to you, but that does not abdicate you from the responsibility to do the best you can to restore and to reconcile. Just because you may consider yourself to be the innocent party does not make you innocent or lacking in responsibility to do what you can to reconcile with he or she who has hurt you. Now, this reaction is important because out of that responsibility, there are certain reactions that could come. The one of them is just to remain the way that you are for the rest of your life and just suck it up and do the stuff you've always done. The next one might be that you would become resentful and you resent even more the person and the situation to the point that you become revengeful and you think, I'm going to get you back and I'm going to plan your demise and I'm going to make sure that you pay for that which you've done. And then if you get really kind of sometimes even religious on this thing, you appeal to the rules, the rules, and you become, you become, a, 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 you know, it's all about, man, until you tell the truth, we're not going anywhere and the rules are this. You will see that Jesus, who is the ultimate in rightness, never rubbed his rightness and the rules in the face of those who were in need. He never did that. Never once did he lay guilt on anybody for the things that they had done. Never once did he beat anybody up because of his rightness. And yes, Jesus, the Son of God, nobody more right and righteous than him. He never came down and said, now I'm just going to tell you how bad you really are and rub his rightness in your face. He never done that. Why do we do that? We're saying the rules. The rules are the rules. You know, and you've broken the rules. Therefore, you have to pay. And that's not good. 
We rub our rightness or our superior, supposed superiority in the face of those things. Jesus never, here's the, uh, he never rubbed his rightness in the face of the people around him. Let's take that reaction that we said over here, because very often a reaction is an instantaneous thing. It's like you're programmed to react. It's part of our nature. It's like you prick me with a pin and I will react, like, you know, with surprise. And we react. We reaction is an instantaneous. Sometimes in nature it's, a, it's an instinct to react in a particular way. But the key here is taking your reaction and turning it into a response. We do have to respond to the things that are going around us. That's what taking responsibility means, that I will respond appropriately by understanding a few things. In taking this thing properly and responding, you've got to understand the first one, the reaction is based upon the rules. Your response needs to be based upon relationships. Because relationships, people, 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 relationships are always more important than the rules. If you had a deck of cards and relationships and, and reactions were put in rules, were to be put in that deck of cards, you will always find relationship trumps reactions and, rela- and rules every single time. It trumps them all. It's the joker in the pack. Relationships is why we do this thing. Why on earth do you think Jesus went to such lengths to leave the glory of heaven and to come down and be born in a stable, a stinking stable, to be hung ultimately upon a cross and killed? Why would he do that? He wasn't doing that for fun. He was doing that because of his love for you. For God so loved the world. He loved you so much that Jesus went through all of that pain and that suffering to lay down his life for you because he valued relationships. And when sin came into the world in the Garden of Eden and the relationship was broken, God's heart was broken over that. And so in this ideal of relationships, where we see how it doesn't call for recompense, you see, the rules call for recompense and repayment. And it's a, this is a big thing, but you'll notice that a big truth of people who respond well to, to reconciliation are not into recompense, but they're into reimbursement. Reimbursement. Have a look at, at Luke chapter 19. You see the story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus conned people. He was a rip-off con man. And he had stolen many thousands of rands from people that he had conned in taking taxes that he said he was going to pay to the government, but he stuck it in his pocket. And he was a tax collector. And then when he came to know Jesus, he became a new creation, which we read about just now. And new creations have new ways of thinking. New creations have new ways of living. And he said, I will not call for recompense because I found out. But he said this to Jesus. He said, today, Jesus, I will give half of my wealth to those people that I've hurt and to the poor. And I will give, if I've cheated anybody of money, I will give him back four times what I've cheated him. And Jesus said, I think today salvation has come to this house. You see, people who are into relationships Always understand reimbursement trumps recompense every single time. You see, reconciliation, people are into reconciliation. I guess they they understand the power of apology. You know what an apology does? And if you're waiting to receive one, you could wait forever. But if you're waiting to give one, you're not going to sleep very well. Because you know that you have to give one. So the sooner you do this, the better. The sooner you go to that person and say, you know what, I really need to apologize. You know the, the rules of apologies? If an apology has a but or an if in it, it's not an apology. If you go and you say, hey, Mike Fenner, I need to apologize to you for, for what I did. I bumped in your car and I never told you. But if you, but if you hadn't parked there, I would never have dinged your car. You know, that, that illegitimizes your apology straight away. 
Or if only you had parked your car somewhere else. But you know this is a no parking zone, Mike. You know, why did you park it? If only you'd parked over there, I would never have dinged it. And any apology that has a but or an if in it is an illegitimate, false, pseudo apology. But when people understand the power of a genuine apology, man, that's an incredibly powerful, powerful place. Thank you, Michael. I'm sorry. And I didn't ding your car. It was Helene. Okay. <laughs> well, it could have been Billy Lardica. He forgot to put the handbrake on. Okay. The results of all of this, the results of this restor is found in, in a couple of R's. Let's talk about the results here. Is restoration. Who doesn't want to be restored to whoever they've broken relationship with? If you don't, there's something wrong with you. you know, everybody desires to be restored. And the interesting thing is in restoration, you know, it's kind of like taking a, it's, it's like this. These are my glasses. One day I broke these glasses and I restored them. But I couldn't restore them to their original state. And now if you look at my glasses, there is a, a crack here. And I took super glue. And with my clumsy fat fingers, I fixed my glasses with super glue. But you look at my glasses now, you can say, Trevor, there's a crack in where you fix it. You haven't really restored it. You've just fixed it. Well, God, when He restores, there's always scars that are left. And the intriguing thing here is that if I were to try and break these glasses or the rim of these glasses again, the place where it would not break is the place where I fixed it because it is so strong. And those scars that happen in your life when people have hurt you and you've been able to restore your relationship with them, the scars will live on. The scars don't go away, but I've got to tell you, apparently chicks dig scars, but, but God looks you over for scars. When you get to heaven one day, He's not going to look for you for awards and diplomas and degrees, as good as all those things are, in light of what we heard just now, but He will look you over for scars. And you will say, what's this scar? And you will say, oh man, Lord, that's the scar that happened when, when somebody trashed my business and stole all my money. Or oh, this is the one where, where, man, there was unfaithfulness. And this is the one, and God's going to say, well done, man. Well done. Every scar tells a great story, and it strengthens you for, for life. This restoration is key. First thing it does when it restores is it renders, let's use that word, Satan weaponless. Satan's greatest tool against you is to use guilt. And when you are guilt ridden, you can never really experience the beauty of who God is. When Satan uses guilt and reminds you of your past and all the failures and all the mess ups of the past, you render him guiltless when you walk with short accounts with the people around you. When reconciliation happens between you and the people in this messed up world who mess you up and you mess them up and reconciliation happens, Satan has got no, he's got no weapon to hold against you. But the moment you continue with these, with these issues and these things against people and, uh, and you never reconcile correctly, you've got you to understand that Satan has every tool and every right to use that tool to continue to make your life miserable. You're giving him the tool. You're surrendering your responsibility. and say, Satan, beat the heck out of me with that. So take it back, people. Take ownership of that. Get angry about that. And say, Satan, I will no longer allow you to use this tool of anger and aggression and unforgiveness against people around you. And Satan will leave you alone. You won't understand how free you will experience will be. And then the last, let's talk about reclaiming. You lose a lot, hey, over the course of time when you live with broken relationships. But there's a beautiful verse in Joel chapter 2, verse 23, I think it is. It says this, that I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. So you can go ahead and reclaim the joy that you once had, the peace that you once had. And now you've lost it, but at this particular point, you can go ahead 
and reclaim that. Now, lastly, I just want to ask you very quickly as you've contemplated these things, the last R for this section I want to ask you is, are you ready? Are you, are you ready to reconcile and to recognize the need of it. It's easy. You'll know it because you're not sleeping well. You'll know that you need to reconcile with somebody when you tell the same story over and over and over and over again, much how they hurt you. You'll know that you become obsessive with the stories, that you become obsessive with the pain. And every time you tell the story, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It started as something small and now like a war story, it's so big that you can't even, you wouldn't even know you're lying. And the tragedy is, is every time you tell the story over and over again, you believe your own darn story. That's a crazy thing. It started as something small, but by the time you've told it a hundred times, all of a sudden, you believe the lie or the exaggeration that you've spoken yourself into because you've relived, there's another R, you relive the pain over and over and over again. You obsess. You get ulcers. You don't sleep. That's why I like the story in Genesis 33 of Jacob and Esau. Jacob and Esau is a great story. Jacob ripped off his brother Esau quite badly, and then he ran, and he ran, and he ran. There's another R. When you don't refuse to reconcile, you're going to run, and you're going to run, and you're going to run, and you're going to run. And one day he couldn't sleep. He was miserable. He was a, he was a wreck. That's a W. He was a wreck. <laughs> and, and he stopped, and he said, I need to go and see Esau. Courageously, he did the whole procedure. He said, I need to reconcile with my brother. Finds out where his brother is, goes, courageously steps into the world where he could have been very vulnerable, and he was very vulnerable, and he reconciled with his brother. Let me tell you people, that guy slept well that night. His ulcers recovered. His aches and his pains became less because this has a way of being toxic to who you are spiritually, physically, emotionally. So I ask you again, are you ready to reconcile? Now the next question you're going to ask me is what about if I get rejected? Well, simple answer is there. You forgive. You see, there's a difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. Forgiveness is something that happens inside of me, where I forgive somebody. I don't need that other person to be present. That other person could even be dead. I don't need it, because forgiveness is not about them, it's for me. And when I forgive somebody, something happens inside of me. Reconciliation is different. Forgiveness needs one person, you alone, to be there. Reconciliation, however, needs a group of people, or two people at least to be joined in a conversation of reconciliation. But the answer to rejection of, of what you're trying to do is simply learn how to forgive. Learn how to release that which they have done to you. Learn how then to rest after all of this. This is exhausting stuff. You're going to be exhausted by the end of following this, this, this checklist. You're going to be exhausted. There will come a time when you've done all of that, and ultimately when you release, you'll be ready to rest. Anybody need a rest here? Yeah? <laughs> a lot of us. And we will rest. And you're saying, Trevor, that's impossible. Well, I want to remind you of that beautiful verse that says that I can do all things through Christ too. Strengthens me. You're saying it's impossible for me to forgive that guy. Trevor, you don't know what he did to me. Trevor, you don't know how much he hurt me. I don't care how much he hurt you. All I know is if you want to do what's good for me, for yourself, you better follow the procedure. And learn what it means to rest in God using the strength of God. Then, then here's another R. Oh, what about refreshing? Then after you've rested, you can refresh yourself. David did this after he had messed up with Bathsheba and his son had died. And he mourned and he cried and he prayed for his son to be healed. And then all of a sudden his kid died and he, he suddenly everybody thought that David is going to be mourning even deeper, but he didn't. He went and he realized that the time had come for him to rest 
And then it said he refreshed himself. He stood up. He took a bath. He put ointment on himself. He put some new clothes on. And he refreshed himself. And then you know what he did after he'd done that? He reset his purpose for life. And he says, I'm, no, I'm still a king. I've got stuff I have to do. I've learned from this thing. But I'm now rested. I've reset. And you reset through worship, people. Worship is so important in order to refresh. That's, where we, that's why I love doing this. Don't you feel refreshed after we've sung songs and as we've, we've worshiped God for who He is? Man, something happens in my soul, man, when I sing and I worship and it's refreshing. And I leave here from today ready and reset to fulfill the kingdom of, of God. Now, one last thing on this last thing of resetting. 2 Corinthians 5 speaks about being an ambassador <clears throat> of reconciliation. To be reconciled is one thing, but to take reconciliation to the world around you, that's another. And that's the cause of Christianity. That's basically another way of putting the commission of God to go into the world, the world and, and preach the gospel. Because God wants to be reconciled. And He says we are ambassadors of reconciliation. There's no other spiritual reason and real reason in life to, re to live by according to the fact that you are purposed to be an ambassador for reconciliation. Not only you reconciled to the world, that's one thing, but telling people that God wants to be reconciled to them. We were chatting earlier about this where we said, you know, ours is the only faith in the world is the only faith in the world that has a God who wants to reconcile with us. Every other faith out there once has a God that judges them, that is a God that counts, like a computer counting all your faults and your sins. A God out there who's going to hold you accountable for your sin and throw you into some form of hell. The real God that we have is a God who's crying out for reconciliation. He wants to be reconciled to you. He's planned it. He's taken responsibility for it by hanging upon a cross. And he holds his hands out to you today, as I hope you will hand out, hold your hands out to the people who have hurt you. But God holds his hands out to you today and says, the reason I cried out forgiveness upon the cross, Father, forgive them, is that you had not responded to my call for reconciliation. You see, if reconciliation doesn't happen, then forgiveness needs to be the next thing. That's why Jesus did that. The last line, he says, I implore you. That's a strong word. I don't know if it's a stronger word. I beg you. That's a good one. I plead with you. But it's even better. I implore you to be reconciled to God. If you don't reconcile with the people around you, that's your fault. But I implore you today to get reconciled to God because he holds out the olive branch to you. He says, I love you dearly. It's because of the shed blood of Jesus that you get to be reconciled to me today. He did it all. He planned it. You can't pay for it. He has desired reconciliation with you. I hope you don't disappoint him. I really do. Come, let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, in today's robust world of bumpy relationships and different ideas, different rules, different expectations. I don't think there's one of us that sits here today that doesn't have something on their mind to say, man, wouldn't it be cool if I could be reconciled to that person? I don't have to agree with them. I don't have to be right and flaunt my rightness in their face in order to be reconciled. Thank you, God that you never did that to us. You never flogged us to death with your rightness. You never rubbed it in our noses. 
you just said, man, I love you. And the proof of my love for you is seen in my shed blood on your behalf. Thank you, Lord, today. As we, your children, sit before you today, help us to process these things well. But not just to do that, because that's just in our heads. May we do it in our hearts and into the hands of reaching out to those around us as well. Thank you that you are a reconciling God. We celebrate that today because of your blood. In Jesus' name, amen.